So I'm Nicholas Wilton, and uh, I'm uh, happy to be in Jeffrey Beauchamp's uh, studio today. Um, came over, and we're uh, getting to look at his work and hear a little bit about um, how he makes these amazing paintings. Um, we're in Fairfax, California, and um, it's uh, middle of April. Beautiful day, and uh, it really reminds me a lot of his work, the clarity and brightness. And uh, so I thought we'd just kind of take a little time to um, try and understand what, what, what and how um, Jeffrey makes, makes this amazing work. I'll try to make it clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess to start on this thing, I think obviously we want to, like, how did you get into this? You've been painting forever, but um, just sort of the arc in the beginning, the, the, the short version of how you got to here. And, well, sort of curious. The, uh, what I use mostly is oil paints on canvas, kind of a classic painterly medium. Um, but I didn't do that until I actually went to the Art Institute in 1987 in San Francisco, uh -huh. the Art Institute. Uh, before that, I had done um, a bit of airbrush illustration and um, more cartoony sort of things. I'd always loved Robert Crumb and the Underground Comics guys oh. and those, those sort of you know, pen and ink um, experts. Um, but I had something of a, uh, an epiphany, which I'm, I'm always grateful that I have a chance that I, I actually had an epiphany, you know, because <laughs> when, when you get asked this question, it's nice to have a, a, a definite point in time where you can kind of point to, and I, it could be that I've sort of reinvented my history, that that is convenient, and so I keep telling that same story. But uh, I was walking through the, the Boston Museum of Fine Art, I was about 19, and I was by myself. Uh, going to school in Worcester, um, not knowing really what I wanted to do. And I started looking at these paintings, and they were just so timeless. And these, these little quiet windows into these you know, very convincing spaces. You know, they're, they're, very, they're realistic paintings, um, very academic by mm -hmm. you know, today's standards. But they're like, beautiful. Like 100 years old? Or, I mean, were these um, old, like... Yeah, uh, one, there was a Bougereau. I mean, I'm, I, oh, they're, OK, so I love not, those. Not yeah. the kind of things that you're, you're proud to mention when you're at the Art Institute uh -huh. and everything is real like right. blood and guts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Expression these are stuff. classic, realistic. These are very yeah. academic, yeah. But the lighting, what it was was, and I think I can be specific, um, there was a, a Bougereau and there was a, um, oh, what's this other guy, one of those guys who would do those real oriental kind of scenes of the women in the in the baths really oh uh, yeah um, but this one was actually um, the scene and it's, it's, a, it's a, a famous painting the gray cardinal where he's coming down the stairs it's almost like a 19th century Norman Rockwell it's that kind of thing where it's, uh. it's, it's very genre but I just I saw this light this beautiful sort of soft uh, top light that these guys would use these French guys in the 19th century like Bougereau because they had these wonderful studios that had that kind of skylight, and it was this real kind of soft Paris light. It was in these paintings. And I was just so struck by that, and it really grabbed me. And I thought the epiphany part was I realized, you know, I could do that. that is, I can see myself doing that. Um, and it, it, probably part of it was because I was so lacking in purpose at the time mm -hmm. that had to have something like that to hold on to was, was thrilling and, and inspiring. Um, and so that was a big moment and it, it inspired me to come out here and um, I actually was doing some animation uh, in New York City at the time for uh, TV commercials which was very fun very it was pre-digital it was all these sort of hand cut scribbly things uh, that were really fun to do labor intensive and um, I thought I would get an animation degree at the Art Institute and they didn't really have an animation degree uh. at, the, at the time and they probably still don't so I had to choose between filmmaking and painting and I thought, I, I'll bet I could learn a lot from the old masters, uh, you know, their, their lighting. I was still thinking about the light. And so I started spending a lot of time in the library at the Art Institute, uh, just soaking up all the monographs on all the great painters. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you say lighting because, you know, at the beginning of this sequence, I just, today was really, it's cold and it's crisp mm -hmm. out. And, 
that is a big piece of your work. There, it's a lighting thing. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and until yeah. I just said that, until you just said that, I mean, I never really knew that. But that's what I, that's yeah. something yeah. that is still in your work. It's really interesting. It's, it's a certain, it's like a north, I don't know, what is it about the lighting that, like, what kind of lighting? I mean, it's... Well, you know, studying a lot of old art, I would get really uh, immersed in the, the feeling. And, and part of the feeling that a lot of people glom onto pretty quickly when you're studying any kind of art, especially Renaissance art, is that sort of what they call Venetian lighting, which is, right. we think of Titian or Tintoretto right, right, and these guys, right. Giorgione, who, you know, you, you see these just dreamy sort of sunset warm light from the Veneto and from that area of, of Italy. Um, and I, I, that's my default setting. I mean, that's, it's like, you know, these, these clouds, nine times out of ten, they're, they're sunset clouds, which, you know, is one of the many patterns that we try not to fall into too often. But, um, yeah, the light is just so critical and evocative. Um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the other things I remember was seeing, it was in a, I was in a class called Underwater Archaeology and the History of Seafaring. Oh, my God. Which is, if that's not a stoner, <laughs> waste your time kind of class, I don't know what is. It turned out to be way too rigorous for me. And I, 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 ended up kind of, I was kind of reeling because this guy really was serious. You know, we'd go in there and he was a diver and an, and an archaeologist and a scientist. Jesus. He, he wrote his heart. But to give him credit, uh, he showed us old art, too. And I can't really remember why. But it, one of the things that stand out was he showed us a slide of, Giorgione's The Tempest, uh -huh. which is just this little painting, but it just it blew my mind, and and I don't remember the sequence of events. It could it could be that seeing that inspired me to go to the Boston Museum afterwards, mm. but um, The Tempest is just one of those paintings that it just you know knocks you out, and people have written about it for years. It's um do you know that you know yeah, what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, the yeah. guy that's like a young man standing there, and he's wearing sort of the the party colored classic Renaissance garb. He's sort of a shepherd. And then on the other side is this woman nursing a baby. And then between them, behind them, the majority of the piece is actually this stormy Venetian that sky. background yeah, you know, right. with, with these weird ruins and this clouds. And there's, 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 there's a, a, a power to that painting. There's a spell that he weaves that's mm -hmm. just so compelling. Um, so that's, you know. Yeah. And so you take any, I mean, you're, you're painting you know, plastic toys even, but you're putting it, you're imbuing it with that significance by using this lighting. Well, the light is definitely, it's, it's a way in. You know, the, the light is, everything we um, are reacting to or creating or, or, you know, any of the interactions we have with art and with painting are visual for the most part. You know, I mean, it's hard to talk your right. way out of that because it's just how it is. Um, and so, you know, the light is, is, is key, the color is key. But you know what I've tried to do uh, over the years, going through different phases, um, is I've realized at a certain point that there's a certain tyranny uh, that our eyes sort of subject us to, and especially as artists, because what we want to do a lot of times is create something that the eye recognizes. You know, and for 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 centuries that was the the job of painting was to create stuff that people recognized. You know, I mean, you you could have your own style. And you could, you know, choose your own subject matter within reason if you wanted to be successful. But until people started painting um, abstraction, or even pushing it like someone like Monet, or uh, even John Singer Sargent, yeah, right, both of whom right. are, are wonderful influences and uh, my big heroes, uh, they started to sort of push that idea, the Impressionists especially, that idea that the, the, the job of paint is to reinforce what your eye already knows. In other words, to, to create things that are familiar. And these guys, Monet would, would paint, especially towards the end of his life, would paint these just, you know, these salads, these just riots of color that, uh, you know, you look at him, you're like, I can tell that's his garden. But man, look at it, it's, just, it's paint too, it's clearly right. paint. It's, it's, these, it's a it's painting these, first it's and then these subject matter second. Very assertive yeah. brush strokes and, and the paint is, the, it's, it's the surface, you know, right, and it's, right. it's that conflict between, he, he wasn't interested in abstraction per se, neither was Sargent, you know, th these guys, they like the world. They like to portray stuff that they know, but boy, they, they have a very sassy kind of defiant way of, yeah, of, yeah, of doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I like that in betweenness of it. And then, um, so the, the the idea of the tyranny of the eye um, gets a little bit broken. Now it's it's and once you reach pure abstraction, or someone like de Kooning, who I feel even though it's super loose, 
you still see stuff in there. You know, and mm -hmm. you can tell by his titles, like LaGuardia in a Paper Hat. Mm -hmm. Or as soon as you read that, you're like, oh, I see, there, is, there, there he is with a paper hat. <laughs> or there's one that he did of, um, from the view uh, out on Long Island, Long Island Sound or something. And you can see it's this, just this storm. It's like this kind of thing. Uh -huh. And then there's like a little tiny sailboat that he's painted in, you know. It's just like this <laughs> right. very, you know, clear gesture huh. to, to reality. But um, so I, I like that. I, I like that idea uh, of using paint and the ideas of light that the eye understands, because that's the language we're speaking. That's the grammar you have to work in when you're painting. Uh, but I like the idea of the sort of defiant, you know, taking, taking the, the recognizable and the distance uh, and making little cracks in, in it, you know, doing stuff right. that, that fights that, that actually right. is. So there's a tension sets between, up a tension. we yeah. recognize, and I see you do this a lot where you have, I mean, even in these brushstrokes, these are, some of these brushstrokes are the value of what the underside of a cloud is in the sky. And you just put it there and it's like, right. oh, well, we've seen that value, we've seen that color Correct. in the sky. We haven't seen it like that, right. but it's familiar and we recognize yeah. it, but yeah. then we don't recognize it. And there's that, there's that dichotomy, there's exactly. that juxtaposition, yeah. which is really interesting. Yeah. It's like a scramble, but it's realism, but it's not. And, and it's just a really unusual thing that, you, that you're chasing down, I think. I mean, that's... Yeah. It's very interesting. Well, I appreciate it. The um, these this kind of a big painting like this occurs over a long period of time. Um, I, I would love to be more efficient in these sort of things, but I, I kind of have have sort of conceded to the process that it just takes a lot of time. It takes less time than they used to. Well, like how long does it take? I mean, you're working on something like this. This is a five well, this one, or six This one is actually painting. done. Did I sign it? Yeah. Usually, when I sign it, it means I've reached the point where I feel like it's done, uh -huh. <laughs> which doesn't preclude the idea of going back into it. But, but you're doing like little passes and often on something like this. You might yeah, work on this multiple times. Uh, yeah, many, many times. There's a big old tree under this. There was a painting that actually I gave to the gallery uh -huh. um, last year um, hastily because they, they saw a JPEG of it and they had somebody um, who was interested and so they, I let, let it go thinking like, ah, it's not really done. <laughs> yeah. But also thinking, if they want to buy it, okay. Yeah, yeah right. I can right. use the money. But, and it was okay. <laughs> it wasn't terrible. But it was, a, it was a very different kind of painting. It was much more um, an object in space. It was this big vertical dark tree ah. um, based on a Claude drawing, um, which just even that much contrivance uh, I find hard to justify sometimes. But um, I, I got it back. It didn't, didn't, didn't sell, so I got it back. And uh, I just kept reworking it and reworking it and um, using a mirror and a reducing glass to get some distance. Uh -huh. So yeah, what I, what I want with a painting like this is for, you know, if you saw it at 60 yards, you'd say like, oh, that's a cool painting, a cool landscape. You can see it. It, 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 it conforms to yeah. classic, you know, rules of, of space right. and depth right. and color right. And, right. And, and perspective. But as soon as you get anywhere near, like, you know, 20 feet away, you start thinking like, huh, that's, that's kind of brush strokey. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. That's not as easy. Right. As, you're not falling in it quite as quickly. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Which is great. That, that. I talk about that like a loud conversation, you know, that distant view has got to right. be really compelling. Right, yeah. But then, you, but then you get up close and then you have this, it's just all like scrambled, you know. Yeah. And so you, you use a redu reducing glass so you can yeah. be close to this, but you can see what it looks like small. Well, what I realized at a certain point, back even before the digital days, when we were still shooting stuff on slides and, mm -hmm. and transparencies, was when you had a slide of a painting, um, you know, it's such a wonderful poppy, yes, saturated yes, image yes. that even digitally now I, I, I kind of miss it. That, yeah. You know. But what it would do when you see, when I look up at slides a lot of times, I have a whole sheet of them and I'd see the paintings now in a way that I hadn't before. And, yes. and sometimes it was disappointing. Sometimes it was like, ah, oh, mm -hmm. I can see where that could be better. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, and the yeah. painting's gone. Yeah, yeah. And you're looking at the slide and you're like, oh man, I, I didn't see that area where I could have used a little more contrast or that mm -hmm. color could be yeah. a little better. And some of that is just time. Some of it happens just because you know you think you're done, and then ten years later you see a painting and you cringe. Well, you're, you're improving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're getting more sensitive. But I realized the, the just the physical act of shrinking that image down to a little what we now think of as a thumbnail mm -hmm. um, is super valuable. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. And so it's, I don't have a huge space, and so I've realized at a certain point, actually when I was in school, they would tell us to use uh, a mirror. Um, Leonardo recommends that to, to look at your work in a mirror. So I would set up a big mirror 
which instantly gives you twice as much distance to your, right, to your subject. Right, right, right. And it flips the image. Which is great, which too. Which is good to fool your brain. we tend to favor always leaning to the left. I yeah. see that my, everything yeah. in mind drifts to the left, <laughs> you know, and it's like, God. So I've turned it up. I actually yeah. turn it upside down oh, the, yeah, yeah. to fight that. But yeah, yeah you, you actually, I remember you have mirrors in here. and that's So, yeah, the mirror is really helpful. It gives you distance. And also the reducing glass uh, just pushes it back that much further. So what I'm, what I'm getting is a very far away flipped version of what I'm working on, um, which is wonderful for the whole idea of keeping the interest alive. Because yeah. otherwise, if I was just standing here straight, looking at my painting straight, I'd have maybe 45 minutes of what I think of as like open mind time, uh -huh, uh -huh. where I can still see it, and I haven't saturated my brain yet. Right, um, that objectivity. Yeah, because yeah, after yeah. a while, you just, I just, you can't see it, and you just. So you, you move, how much you time on. do you say you work? Before switching, kind of thing. Well, I mean, with the mirror and the and the reducing glass, um, I've also speeded up my my. <laughs> I've speeded up my working time, which is a nice way of saying I've I've gotten less patient. <laughs> yeah, right, um, right. So what right. I'll generally do is I'll have a whole bunch of stuff I'm working on at the same time. So as I work on this, um, I'll work on it for maybe an hour. Yeah, right. You know? That's what and I'm then fine too. put it away and get out something else. Yeah. Um, just to keep it fresh, you, you kind of have to have a few right. balls in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's way, way easier, yeah. and you speed along better. Yeah, yeah. and there's yeah. less pressure. It's less, you know, I, I do a number of commissions, and commissions are great because somebody's guaranteeing you they're going to pay you, which right, is nice, right. which is not like the spec work that mostly I do. Um, <laughs> But spec work. it's all spec work. You, know, you, you do stuff and you hope. You're like, oh, somebody yeah, will hopefully buy this. Right, you know, right. la la la. You know, the calendar pages are flipping past. Hope little, little, little dollar signs are flying away. Yeah. You know? um, but yeah, commissions are nice because you, you have that guarantee of income. But uh, sometimes the deadlines can be. I've gotten wise about giving people enough time, giving myself enough time. But that's the worst I find is when you, you've got a commission and you've got something, especially when it's open. Like, oh, we want a landscape. You know, make it pretty. Yeah, and then you've got okay, I've got to be done by Thursday, and oh god, that's the worst right. to have to kind of force yourself to work through the time where you would like to just say, you know, when you when you s up. Um, starting new work, I mean, do you have a plan or are you some of these are you just I mean you you run the gamut from you've got landscapes, you you do portraits, you do abstractions of both and mm -hmm. objects and. How how much of it is how how where is where are the where are you getting inspiration from and what's your process like? Um, that's the, that's a good question. Um, motivation. And we just I just gave you this metaphor before. The the, the 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 ugly truth, the crass truth, is that you know artists have to eat. <laughs> so so there's 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 two motivations to oversimplify. There's there's money and there's freedom. You know there's there's the wonderful creative thing that we all like to believe in and uh -huh. keeps us going. Um, but aside from someone saying, you know, paint my dog, um, <laughs> you got it. Which actually you can, you can I, do those really well. I'm happy well. to paint dogs. I will paint your dog. <laughs> <laughs> They're good. I, 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 I don't, I can't do that, but that, but yeah, I can see how you, you well, could do great dog. Back paint. in the days of the academies, you know, the centuries of, of official painting, um, that was one of the, the lowest you genres. You start with the dogs, you know, right? Oh yeah. The only thing lower than painting animals was painting like fruit and flowers. Oh, you know? oh, right. So even someone as accomplished and wonderful as, as Fantin Latour would, would be not as esteemed as someone who painted, you know, oh, history paintings. You know? Wow. But, yeah, so you have, when you're left to your own, like if you could question, wave a magic right. wand, what, how, what's your process or how do you find that um, uh, subject matter or just the inspiration to? Sometimes it's as simple as, as getting a new tube of paint. You know, if, Hand me, a, hand me a tube out of there, and, and you know. So here's. Well, I love not, how you crinkle the bottom. I think a, you turned me onto that roller thing. That was a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, well, see, cadmium yellow deep's not such a good example. What I was going to say. I was, love cadmium yellow deep. Yeah, That's but why what I, I chose it. What I was going to say, apropos, okay. what's motivating? Here, I'll get one. All right. Um, like, uh, oh, here we go. Like rose gray. There's so many obscure little colors, especially Holbein makes um, a wonderful range of colors yeah. that you can. You know, if you're not lazy like me, you can actually mix out of other colors. But some of them, I can't resist, so I'll buy them um, if it's a new thing. And sometimes that's enough just to be inspired, to have like a new, a new shade color. of paint. You right, know, like, wow, right. I've never had this exact shade before, and, and that will, will lead to something else and, and motivate. But um, it really depends. You know, if, if I'm doing um, 
a landscape where I think, okay, this is going to go to the gallery. This is just going to go out into the world. Um, I'll just start off loose, loosey goosey, because that's the really I no actually, plan. You're just figuring no, it out as you go. I just, it's gestures. It's just color, just, colors. It's, it's laying down a baseline because you know you've got this blank canvas, huh. which intimidates some people. I, I'm not intimidated at all. It's, that's like my favorite part because there's no pressure. <laughs> right. The beginning <laughs> the hard, part. The hard part is like just before it's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. The stakes are high. I gotta yeah. make the exact right move, you know, or else this could keep going for another month, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's interesting because, like, what I found is that. I like the beginning part so much because there's no pressure and mm -hmm. I'm extending it like I'll stay an extra hour in it because it's so fun and, yeah. and all kinds of cool things come out of it sure. and it's almost like I don't even want to I'd rather just have, like, hire someone to finish it <laughs> than, than uh, you know I, so that's interesting that you do that you do find the same thing there's whole villages in China that you can hire. <laughs> yeah, right. they're happy to right. finish your painting <laughs> um, yeah the I wish, like it's like you're saying, I wish there was that sense of uh, lightness. That's what it is. Because like, there's, there's literally very little paint on the canvas, but there's like very little pressure on yourself to come yeah. up with some genius move. Because um, that's how it is. And, and uh, I don't know if we said this already, but um, you, know, you get to the end of a painting, and assuming there's some kind of deadline, like you've got a show or somebody's waiting for it, um, the pressure is, just gets incrementally higher and higher to the point where you think like every stroke I have to do today, you know, given that I have like 45 minutes to finish this thing, has to be brilliant. Has know? to be on. Yeah. And I can, I can do it. I can get in that headspace where I can fool myself, essentially, give myself a sort of false sense of confidence. Mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, you can let go if, if, you, if you are feeling it that day <laughs> where, yeah. where you, you can convince yourself like, Anything I do is interesting. Uh -huh, you know, I'm, right. I'm at the point where, and I do feel this way, um, actually, that really whatever I do now is, is interesting because my skills are at their peak. You know, I feel like yeah. I've got, I can, paint, I can paint anything. The challenge is like, what do I do? Where do I put my time? Because, you know, I'm, I'm not getting any younger and I feel like, you know, I probably have a certain, you know, you could, if you were horribly morbid, figure out, how many hours do I have left realistically? You know, between, you know, how many, is it like a thousand hours? Is it 10,000 hours? Yeah, right. But it's a right. finite amount. And you can't, you know, can't obsess about that. But um, To sort of make it count. I mean, I, yeah. know, I know that, I think I know what you're talking about, where you're, it's like, um, you know, when I talk about this with students, you know, like finishing, you, you have to get, um, you got to get like really sensitive. Right. Like really dial it up. Mm -hmm. Like, like you can't talk to people when you're doing this part, you know. Like when right. I'm painting normally, like I have friends, I'll invite people to come over. I'm really busy, and I'm like, yeah. come paint because I yeah, gotta yeah. be in the studio all day, and right. I'll have friends come, and you know, music and the dog, and you know, the whole thing. But when I'm trying to finish, yeah. it's like, and I and I have to psych myself into it that I'm like at that level, mm -hmm. and that I can just just I don't even want to hear music, and I'm just trying yeah. really, really to get it just like and it, they're yeah. delicate moves that's the thing you're like a watchmaker you're you're yeah. at first you're like a, a you know spreading the tar on the on yes the, on yes. the pavement you know i was just over at trader joe's the other day and they had the whole pave the whole parking lot closed they were doing redoing the, the pavement and there was this guy driving around on what i thought of as like satan's zamboni because it was just like a zamboni but it was spreading this like black goo uh -huh. like, oh, that is such a fun job but that's that's how you start yeah that's how this yeah. starts yeah and what you're talking about is when you get to the end and you're like yeah. that Geppetto with his with his uh -huh. loop in, and you're putting in the last little emerald, uh -huh. and you can't even yeah you can't even listen to music. Yeah, and that's a really cool way to like the beginning is you can be so loose and and but you want to try to carry some of that looseness right. through, yeah. and that's the beauty of it to where right. your moves at the end actually they might be more refined, but they're made with the same looseness and freshness and that's you just it just yeah. and that's that's the kind of goal maybe yeah. but yeah but it's hard it's hard it is hard I mean. and i i have always sort of uh, bristled at the idea that there's illustration and there's art because some of my favorite artists are, are classified as illustrators you know mm -hmm. maurice sendak or or you know i mentioned um, norman rockwell great, right. great painters both of them are right, fantastic right. um as good as anybody but what I've come to resent about my own work and the process is when I feel like, you know, these landscapes are all invented. They're, all, they're not based on photographs or even me thinking about, oh, what did it look like up on, you know, 
Loma Alta today. It's just, all that definitely informs my internal encyclopedia of uh -huh, images, uh -huh. but they're all very improvisational. And but they're but they're recognizable. Like we, right. I've been to these paintings. That's what right. I find so. And I've, <laughs> well, but what I'm, what I'm not, trying not to do is make them illustrationy. No, 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 no. In no, the sense not. that I'm looking at them, I'm trying to solve a problem, and not solve it the same way every time. For one thing, uh -huh. but also not be too hung up on. Um, you know, like I was working on a painting the other day, and it was one of these smaller landscapes that I'm making up. And I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking compositionally, I'm thinking the big shapes, I'm not thinking detail. But I fall into this trap of, and it's probably going back to the tyranny of the eye, like I talked about, where what would it look like if I was, if it, you know, what should be here? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and that's, a, that's a trap. It can work, it can help you. But I find myself getting tighter and tighter, and I don't want to be Geppetto with the jewel, you know, thing, if I can help it, you know, because uh -huh. I like the the broader gesture. I like I like being able to like install that little tiny jewel in the watch with a big fat brush yes, loaded with yes. CAD yellow, yes, right? right, and pull that off. Uh huh. You know, uh -huh. that's yeah. that's better yeah. for me. And and it's riskier. It's more of a high wire act, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. than yeah. thinking like, okay, like, hmm, should I get some you know r resource images to see like what. A, a path going up the hill with a oh, bike. Yeah, like, no, 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 no. That's the kiss no. of death. Um, but um, let me let me grab one thing here. Hang yeah. On. yeah. Um, so this one is called "Whatever Keeps You Up in the Air," because away from the couch, it's all hot lava. And, <laughs> which is and you have these titles like this. Like yeah. what? What is that? They're, well, they're, that one refers to. I think every kid has had that game in their heads where you're playing and you're on the couch and it's the rest of the world is hot lava. Oh, right? okay, okay. So, so there's stories, but I mean, your titles are like they're long. They're not just some like of them are, yeah, some blue of them are ghost or something. Right. You're you're like you're telling a story. Sometimes, I mean, it, a lot of times to, to confess, I will think of what I think of as a clever title and I'll write it down. Uh -huh. There'll be some turn of phrase, or some some uh -huh. literary reference or turn uh -huh. of phrase or something that I think is cool, uh, and I'll write it down. And then when it comes time to, to name a painting, if I don't have a title already, I'll have these you know post-it notes or things where I'll look at it and be like, is that the one that should go with this? And I think, yeah, this, there's something, there's some kinship between yes, this yes, random yes. phrase and that. Random right, thing. but it's almost it's almost like another another point of the kind of openness that the title isn't a literal translation. Right. You're offering another. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's another, a it's a missed opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a frustrated writer. I, I like to write, and mm -hmm. I don't really haven't really pursued it to any great extent. But I, I really appreciate it, and I read a lot. And so it's my chance to be kind of a smartass. Mm -hmm. you know, I can get away with it because people are there's there's the there's the potency and and the the, the value of the paintings, which uh, you know I, I right. concede, right? Right. Uh, so I have a sort of a built-in audience for when they lean in to read the title, read the tag. Yeah. You know, it's my opportunity to yeah. You know, Hit make, make a joke yeah. or you know say something about yeah. something else. Um, so let me bring out a couple okay. others to give you an idea. Um, this is an older painting from uh, 2009, but I, I like to pull it out because it's it has a lot of elements that I really care about. Um, this one's called The Blessings of Literature, which looks like a done deal. It looks like kind of an illustration for an idea, but in fact it was completely reversed. The process was, was started out very abstract, very loose, um, landscape, vertical, and it started to put in these elements one at a time until eventually I thought of a way to sort of combine them into a cohesive semi-narrative. So, um, and that really was, it, it was capped with the, the title itself at the end, the Blessings of Literature. So, I love painting the nude, and I love this image of her. She's so, such benevolence, you know. Um, she was sitting up on a wall, and the hair, her hair was blowing in the wind, and she had this, she just happened to have this sort of, you know, benevolent blessing sort of gesture. Yes, which right. Is, Kind of <laughs> grace kind of, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you could find that in in any number of right. old paintings, and uh, so she's the goddess of literature, and so she's gesturing, and this fireball here comes down, and with all these books flying through the air uh, into the world of um, my son, who I, I took that photo of him uh, years ago when we were visiting uh, someplace back east. And it was a horribly hot day. And it was humid, and it was muggy New Jersey summer, mm -hmm. and he was miserable. And I took this picture, and he came out looking so sort of beseeching and beatific. Uh, and there's no no sign of any of that suffering, so that was nice. That kind of got filtered out. Um, but the idea is that you know you've got these two different um, 
versions of Big Cat, right? You've got the, the Tawny Scrawny Lion, which is another one of those golden books. It's a total golden right? book. And those rabbits, And yes. it's that old sort of 50s, 60s yes. graphic style, which is so fun. Um, he's reading to them. They're, he's, he's actually got a book that he's reading, and they're his little buddies, and they, they adore him, and he's happy to have them as his friends. And he's sitting in this, I don't know if you can really see it, but this sort of mid-century, styly chair. Yes, yes. Uh, so everything about that is very of a time. And this down here, this is sort of the benevolent, version of the big cat and this is the, the the dangerous version of the big cat nature uh which is i pulled from a, a rubens uh painting of one of those tiger hunts which is just this beautifully wow. chaotic violent wow. baroque cyclone of, of bodies and, and animals and so this guy he's getting clawed the tiger's got him right the tiger's like sinking his teeth into his shoulder he's knows he's done for he's this is actually the detail you can't really tell, but he's, he's, he's tried to kill the tiger behind him with a spear and he's missed. And But this, this sort of, you know, crusader knight back here is going to try to save him. So the, the whole general idea, aside from combining things that I love, <laughs> nude women, books, children's books, yeah, Rubens, my son, <laughs> the landscape, it's got everything, uh, is that she is sort of through literature opening his eyes to the benevolence and the, and the dangers right. this of, world of is life. Opening up. Yeah. But what's so interesting to me is how, well, what creates a lot of the interest in this painting is the different feelings of the different areas. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, you've got the cartoony thing, and then you've got this, like, loose volcanic, beautiful sky, and then this sensual, like, it looks like flesh, you know, and then these cartoony books, you know, and then a, then a photographic realism you know, all jumbled together. It's a mashup, yeah. which is, yeah. um, that's also really interesting, but hard to do and hard. You don't seem to have any problem. You're just painting what you like. Style be damned. I don't care, right? I mean, you just, you don't have that. A lot of people have trouble with that. A lot of artists have trouble around. I, I would have trouble painting that line because I'm, it's just not something, I mean, I like it. I might collage it, but I would never paint it. It just right. seems too far out of my... <laughs> Um, out of my bailiwick, you know, like you, yeah. you don't have those limitations, which I think is really interesting. Well, I think I, I appreciate that. The uh, the thing that I realized around this time, a little bit before this time, was that anything that you can see, you can paint, you can translate into paint, and that opened up kind of a, a big door for me, which was um, combined with the idea that you don't have to separate your your genres. In other words, I was doing a lot of landscapes right. and a lot of figures, and I never felt comfortable putting them together. I felt like I, I just, I'm not that good yet. You know, I don't have, I don't know what to say with that or I don't know how to, how to juggle that. Um, and that was, that was one of the points where I started to think like, what do I want my paintings to look like? Which is something I've never done. I never thought like, well, what do I want to be painting? You yeah, know, I know right, what I can right, paint right. and I know what I've referred to and I've yeah. drawn inspiration from. But, you know, given my druthers, what do I want to see? You know, what would mm -hmm. I like to bring into the world that doesn't exist already? Right, right. Um, and so, I, mashup is a good word. I, I was thinking of these as uh, kitchen sink paintings because mm. I would just throw everything in but the kitchen sink. Uh. And, um, you know, it's a bit of a laborious process because I, I would end up painting out as much as I would put in as part of the editing. And, mm -hmm. and in a way, it is very collage-y. And I, that collage is something that I appreciate, but I don't really want my paintings to look like a collage. Right, right, you know, I, wa right. I want him to sort of exist it, with it helps, air. It's all the same world, even yeah. though it's different parts of the world. So yeah. it's, it's a tricky, technically it's tricky because mm -hmm. I, I, I want it to read as a painting and not as a collage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, really cool. So that one came out okay. My wife would love to hang this in our home. If we had a big enough wall, this one would have been at my home as well, soon as it was done. <laughs> Holy shit, man. So this one, uh, like most of them, started out as a landscape. And so the forest scene back there, uh, I wanted to bring it in a little bit. And, and my, my paintings tend to be either wide open, like the one back here, or this one too, for, for the most part, with a lot of sky, a lot of yeah. open space and depth. Or I'll do some something uh, within a forest. So there's this sort of this architecture that comes to play, and it, it, it creates, it gives you a chance to bring in some vertical elements, you know, mm -hmm. trees and mm -hmm. stuff. So I, I wanted to start this one off as a, a, a warm forest, which in the tradition of um, sort of a contrary technique where you've got warm colors generally tend to want to be in the foreground and, and 
you know, to get that depth, you want to use cool colors, or at least, you know, cooler. With this, I wanted to have the idea that the light is warm and it's hitting, but it's in the background. So I started to do that. But then I, I, also, I really wanted to incorporate this gal um, who uh, has painted herself uh, in preparation for a bike ride that goes on every year in Amsterdam where people doff their clothes, paint themselves up in whatever design they like, and then they ride in, in very progressive European fashion through, wow. through the streets on their bicycle. Wow. And so this was an image I found uh, where she's just done an incredible job. Uh, I love the design. You know, she's done this all black with the orange and everything, very Rococo. And the contrast between this, you know, very tribal, exotic look, and then you come up, you see her face, you realize she's, she's, <laughs> she's got like straight blonde hair. She's it just, it's a funny contrast. Um, and she's got nipple rings, of course. But um, the challenge for this, I, I enjoyed the, the, the image. I wanted to make it sort of life size. But the, um, the challenge I wasn't sure I was going to be able to pull off was the idea that there's very little, aside from her face, there's very little uh, variation in the tone between the planes. Like the, 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 the up plane of her belly is only slightly different in tone than the down plane, you know? Right. And right. plus, then you've got all these patterns which can help you or not, depending right, on if right, you can right. pull it off. You have to shade it properly. Because they change yeah. and they, they right. you know. That's this, amazing. And it's that same, ironically, it's that, it's that same sort of soft top light that we were mm -hmm. talking about with Bougereau right, Bouger, right, and right. Jerome. That was the artist I couldn't think of. Yeah, it's. Which is a sweet light, but it's, it's tricky. It's not like a nice directional hard light. There's no real hard shadows. But anyway, she. Um, she seemed to want to be in that in that woods, and these monkeys and the dog. That's and great. There's a little bit of a, an echo of this mm -hmm. kind of rococo shape from the, mm -hmm. the design yeah. that she did. So it's you know it's another mashup. Yeah, it's so great. It's got a real kind of heat to it, and you can feel the the warm air. So this one was actually one of the very first ones. This is from 2007, uh, that I ended up using as that kind of mashup. Right, te technique right. where I, I just started to give myself permission to use the things that I cared about. That was one thing that I realized was that in order to stay motivated uh, and feel like what you're doing is is, is worthy, um, you have to make your own calls about what the subject matter is going to be. You know, because it's like we talked about. You know, there's only so many hours that you can work, uh, and the, the the possibilities are infinite. So how do you how do you narrow that down? Um, so one of the things I, I keep going back to is, uh, is Rubens, uh, and this started out as just a, what I was trying to do was kind of a, a what would, you know, John Singer Sargent has had a couple of drinks, and he has to do a quick copy of this Rubens, what would that look like? Uh -huh. that's, that's, I thought that's what I wanted my paintings uh -huh. to look like, uh -huh. you know? um, and I, I feel like I pulled it off in, in certain sections, and I did the whole thing, which, which originally has, you know, two guys, two horses, two women, two cherubs, which I didn't notice until I started to look closely. Um, and I did the whole thing in like that, in that style. And it was just, it was nice, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't really, I didn't have enough of my own imp input. Uh, so I painted out part of it. I started to go a little looser. I put this sort of weird Santa hat on the, on the horse, um, which was just random. Uh, and then I put in my friend Paul, uh, who's a friend of mine, who's a, a, a big contractor guy, and he's riding his bike by. And, <laughs> I thought, you know, combining this sort of mythological yeah, yeah, with scene, every day. this larger than life scene with someone just, you know, riding by. And then also, a couple of characters from Uncle Wiggly, which yeah, is an yeah. old, old early 20th century children's book series. Um, and this one is called Plate Tectonics Saved My Marriage. And so it's kind of a reference to, absurd, absurdist reference to um, the idea of large forces. Um, impacting you and and, and I, I like the idea that you know are, are these people even visible to Paul you know Paul is kind of the the sobering factor he's, yeah he's the, he's the, just the every man. he's, he's just, the every right, man right 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 um, and are these are these guys gesturing to him are they just waving hello are they trying to get his attention to like oh save her she's being abducted you know yeah uh, but really it's just an excuse for me to paint what I want it's, which, it's cool again I love the I love this you know just that overlapping like this right. is a thing you know? right. <laughs> yeah I was doing a lot of these sort of butterfly or, or, or bow shapes uh -huh. these graphisms uh -huh. you know these kind of just gestures that I like because it does it, it ties in with the paint yes it, it, yes. Kinda, it, it's, it reminds you it's a paint it's yeah. paint yeah and it, this just by virtue of its coarseness 
comes forward. Yeah. This stuff, the smooth stuff kind of falls back. Uh -huh. Cool. <laughs> so this last one I was going to show you is, uh, it's not finished, um, but I, I thought it'd be good to see stuff in process as well. I, I always appreciate seeing some uh, art that's not done because it, then it gives you a little bit of an insight into how something evolved, you know, and uh, it, it's generally, you know, we're, we're, we're faced with these finished masterpieces that sort of appear like this apparition. Mm -hmm. You don't really know uh, how it became. Yeah, 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 especially older paintings that are so slick. Um, but this one is a uh, uh, obviously a, a big old figure and she's larger than life size actually, she's a little bit larger than life size. And I realized at a certain point that if you have a, a, a canvas, say this big, um, you can make someone bigger by cropping them. It seems like an obvious thing to say, but but to have someone, you know, uh, sitting with their knees up or uh, just in some way, you can kind of instead of filling the, the frame with them. Anyway, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, what I loved about her is this. There's a, there's a continuing um, theme in my stuff where rather than just going for straight beauty, which is nice, but it's not terribly engaging after a while, uh, I like to to sort of tweak it and, and, and show um, you know, beauty with a, some sort of disfigurement or not even disfigurement, but just grace with a little bit of clumsiness. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. uh, Franklin Williams was a teacher I had at the Art Institute and he said, um, if you're going to give the seashell, you got to give the slime. You know, mm -hmm. give, give, the, give the, the rawness, give the, give the slight, if, if just for contrast. You know, That's right, have, have some, juxtaposition. Yeah, yeah, have something a little upsetting to the, to the, to the, to the elegance. So I liked her because she's beautiful and, and you know she's got a great presence. But there's a couple things that I, I think are, are nice and were a challenge to paint, and, and I enjoy that as well. But I, I love the little. Um, it's the kind of thing you, you they would airbrush out, you know, right? In, in a right. glamour shot. And it's not a it's not a great angle. I mean, you never would want to take a picture like this to make right. yourself look, look. Yeah, beautiful. the, the foreshortening is, is, yeah, is it's intense. Like she's kind which of is crumpled. I like. Well, yeah. I like the foreshortening because it really it kind of draws you in. It puts you right in the in the picture. Uh -huh. And it gives you a sense. I mean, look how big her hands are. You know, yeah, she's, right. It's, it's, you're, you're, you're close to her whether you're trying to be or not, uh -huh. which is wonderful. You have that really strong presence. But then you've got these weird shadows, too, that dapple her. And um, there's no, given the, the painting as it is now, there's no obvious source for these shadows. So it's, it's a suggestion of she's in some sort of space that's closer in. And I, I wanted to use this image, but I also wanted to use... Uh, this background, which is something that I, I struggled with um, over the idea of using it, which is it's, it's this wreckage that I just haven't really painted in. I've just started to paint it in. It's the tsunami. It's from the Japanese tsunami. Oh, uh, wow. And you have this just really striking images that we all saw of just the ruins, you know, these things, just the jumble of stuff, the ships in the, in the streets mm -hmm. uh, and the flames from the refineries and the, and the smoke and everything. And I thought... I really, I, I really like that, uh, the notion of her. She's this like really powerful presence, uh, but completely at ease. She's completely at ease. And there's this chaos behind her, this, this ruin, which is also kind of beautiful. So you've got these very uh, kind of conflicted uh, images. And mm -hmm. I, I had to sort of think, do I feel okay using uh, the tsunami image? Because I thought I didn't want to trivialize that or make light of it, uh, given the suffering. Um, so eventually, I, I, I rationalized that it was okay. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. You know, that people, if nothing else, people would remember it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's sort of dreamlike too. It's it's got a, a, a unreal state, which I really like. Great. We'll see how this goes. So the the one of the endearing themes of why we continue to want to paint, which is significant in itself. I, I remember. Chester saying to me, I'm just happy that I still want to paint. And this, was, this was years ago, and I, I didn't, I kind of didn't understand it at the time. I, I, I very soon did, though. I understood, like, you know, I can, I, yeah, it's, it's, it can be uh, exhausting, you know, the idea of coming up with this energy and this motivation. Uh, and sometimes you lose it. Sometimes you lose the, the, the impulse. And so he's, you know, when he says he's just glad that he still wants to paint. Yeah, that's I right. Go, oh, I, told, I hear you. <laughs> I yeah, feel you, yeah, you know? yeah. And I think that one of the things that probably keeps you going as well, that keeps me going, is this idea of exploration. 
and the idea that we are uh, given this opportunity, uh, you get out of it what you put in, you know, and you're creating, like what I do with these landscapes is I, I create a template, if you like, or the beginnings of a world, and then I kind of listen, you know, I, I, I call it listening, it's all visual, but I listen and I think like, well, what do you want, you know, what do mm -hmm. you want, yeah. what do you want next, what does it mean? And uh, I, I like the idea of having that sort of quasi-magical dialogue with, with the process, with, with this place, with this world. Um, and so, you know, if it's a landscape, especially you have that, that nice metaphor of exploration because I'm, I'm just building these things up and knocking them down and I get to play God, essentially, right, with, these, right. with these places that, are not, that don't exist ex until I make them. Um, and it's a journey all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it's a pleasurable journey, and sometimes it's a frustrating journey. Uh, but it's and, and isn't it also that you, it's a metaphor for finding out who you are in a way too, yeah. which is yeah. really it's it's so interesting. And that you have yourself, and then you have what you're making, and there's right. that dialogue between who you're becoming and what your art's becoming, and it somehow grounds you in a place in your life in the world that uh, it could just make sense and it's helpful yeah there's a, uh, a possibly not so wholesome tendency on my part and probably on a lot of artists part to equate your sense of identity with your product mm -hmm. <laughs> with right. the stuff that you make right and if you make a lot of really what do you think of as good product you feel really good about yourself you know like because that's that's you that's what you kind of put your energy and your time into um, and I, th I think I feel, uh, in, the, in the large sense, very lucky to have that because, you know, ours is, is, a, is a, one of the rare careers or, or, or life paths where you can point to a parade of stuff. Right uh, look behind at all, you. Look yeah. at the stuff I've made, you know. And yes. You could argue, like, you, you've, all you've done is you've littered the world. You've put, you've put more crap into the world that people <laughs> have to deal with, you know. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully that people, you know... Uh, benefit from our, our products our production but um, I just you know I, I feel like gratitude has become something of a spectator sport and I, I'm not into that so much I feel like you know be grateful but I don't want I don't need to hear about it <laughs> <laughs> right. but I am grateful I am super grateful yeah and, uh, well it's super inspiring to, and uh, thank you for letting us come I appreciate and it yeah dive into this world of yours it's really really inspiring so always a pleasure Nick. fantastic thanks man yeah mm -hmm.